All right, welcome to Calvary Chapel Artesia. My name is Joseph, one of the elders here. Just want to welcome you here tonight. Also welcome those that are joining on uh, live on Zoom. Uh, just we'll be continuing on through the book of Jeremiah and uh, we'll be picking up where we left off last week, chapter three, starting out in verse 14 and we'll make our way into chapter 14, at least the beginning portion. But before we get started, let's go ahead and prepare our hearts and minds for the word. Allow us to soak in um, God's guidance and uh, comfort and love. Father God, we are so thankful. Thankful for the mercy and the grace that you have for us, Lord. That, yes, we are stubborn. Yes, we have difficulty. Yes, we have challenges. But you're always there to pick us up, Lord. We ask for you to be with us here tonight, Lord. Prepare, uh, with our hearts and minds prepared to hear your word. Thank you for the love and comfort that you provide, the guidance. We ask for you to be with those that are on their way, keeping them safe, protecting them. If they're not able to make it, Lord, be with them wherever they're at. Lord. Do you hear their, their wants, their needs, their prayers, Lord? And we lift everything to you. Also for those here, Lord, let the Holy Spirit pour within each and every one of us, Lord. That way we could be stronger, we could be more like you and be able to share with others what has been shared with us. Prepare us for tonight. Let it be your words, not mine. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so Jeremiah, we've been on quite a journey, journey, and I'm thinking about this. Um, I think about a lot, if I reflect back to the beginning of Jeremiah, you know, there's questions. There's, hey, you know what, or even um, commands. Hey, I need you to do this, or you know what? You're going to you're going to do this. And what did Jeremiah do? He's like, you know, I am just nothing but a youth. What am I going to say? We tend to, and I was thinking about that, reflecting about that. You know, there's always these different comparisons, um, being asked versus being told. And I think about how we make excuses. We always make an excuse. You know, I can't do this because of this. I can't do this because of that. We're always coming up with different excuses. And to us, we make it sound valid. We make it just, we try to justify it. And really, it's not justified. You know, if, if we think about it, we make excuses and then we make excuses, but yet then we have all these wants. We have all these wants. I want friends. Great. Are you in fellowship? No. Well, there is the reason you don't have friends. Okay. I, I, think about a job. You want a job. What do you got to do? Work. You got to go look for it. You know, if if I'm a social worker and I'm just sitting on the couch, there's not going to be some random stranger that knocks on my door and says, hey, you know what? I just happened to be in your area and something told me to knock at your door <laughs> and see if you wanted to be a social worker job. <laughs> it's not going to come to us, but that's our problem. We always want it to be easy. We always want it to come to us. We don't want to put in the work to do it. We don't want to go through the hard, the tough. We just want it to be simple. We want it to be easy. I want knowledge. Okay, great. Here's a book of knowledge that we tend to choose not to read. Now, all the knowledge is right here. But yet, we make excuses. I can't because... Um, I got to do this, this, and this. I got to go get, or I got to go do this task, or I, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't. We can. There's just the difference between a want, a need, an excuse. If we're lacking in something, we did it to ourselves. We are our own worst enemy. If we don't have any of this, it's because we choose not to. We made a choice to not have this, to not have this. 
we made a choice to make excuses. And then what happens is this, when we, when something goes wrong, we get smacked on the hand. Lord, okay, you know what? Thank you for answering my prayer. I promise that I'm going to do this. I promise I'm going to do that. And do we always hold our promises? No. We might for that little season. And then next moment, what happens? We go back to our, our ways. It's so easy to go back to our ways. And I think about Jeremiah. He's like, I'm youth. I don't know what to say. Think about his ministry. We talked about it during the introduction. People do not want to hear him. But yeah, he went on for not even a year, 40 years. And people didn't want to hear him. And he didn't stop. He didn't quit. He didn't come up with excuses. Yeah, at the beginning he did, but he guess what? He worked through it. And instead of pulling a, hey, I don't want to go to Nineveh, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, he pulled through it. He, he came up and he was like, but, 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 but you know what? He still did, did, did. He was obedient. He, he wanted something, the Lord gave it to him. Oh, but I can't find, are you seeking it with the Lord? And I thought about that and I started reflecting about that, thinking, you know, even on my drive here, I was thinking a lot about Jeremiah. Nobody listened to him for 40 years, but yet, what are we doing today? We are reading Jeremiah. We are listening to him. We're applying what he went through. It, you know, he's up there right now saying, man, I am glad that I worked through it. I am glad that I didn't run. I'm glad that I stopped making excuses. And we got to stop making excuses for ourselves. If there is a wall, it's because we put that wall there. If there is something blocking us, or if we're not feeling good, or if we're feeling like, you know, in the mop, mop, moppy waters or anything like that, get out of it. We, get in the word. Get into fellowship. We can pull ourselves out. It's hard, but we got to put in the work. We got to put in the work. And that's what I was really thinking about. Reflecting back to what we've been going through each um, each week in Jeremiah, his experiences, we are no different or better or anything from him. And he gives us an example. He is the example of how we should continue to be obedient, to keep working on what we need to do. So let us go ahead and start in uh, Jeremiah chapter three, verse fourteen and fifteen. Where we're going to be looking at the return and the restoration um, aspects of what we've been reading in. And here it says, Return, O faithless children, declares the Lord, for I am your master. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. You know, God is speaking to Israel. God is speaking to Judah and invites them to return. We know their disobedience of what they've been going through from the past couple of weeks. They made a lot of mistakes. They made a lot of poor choices, decisions, and he's still inviting them. Still inviting them. We make a lot of mistakes. Oh, a lot of mistakes. And he still invites us, still invites us. And even if a nation refuses to repent, this is what's important. Because you think about this, look at our community. We struggle, right? We, we, we look at um, the nation, we look at the world, uh, what's happening around us. We struggle. But even if a nation refuses to repent, God will turn to each and every one of us as individuals. Okay, as, as a collective, you don't want to? <clears throat> Joseph, where do you stand? You know, so-and-so, where do you stand? But it's going to come to that. Think about this. If you repent, if you acknowledge your sin, I will bring you back. That's what he's saying. If you repent, acknowledge your sin, I will bring you back. 
Okay. We see that, and I'm not going to go through it in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Read Deuteronomy chapter 30. And look what look what he says in there about, you know, all the things that has been done and repenting and acknowledging sin, and he'll bring you back. People say, but I don't like reading the Old Testament. Right? There's many different reasons. The same reason why people say, I don't like reading Revelation. Right? We were just talking about it um, this morning. There's there, there's some pretty straight to the heart, some stuff that's like, man, you know, we, you know, like, how can that happen? Why would God, you know, people with this question, why would God allow for such things to happen? So what do they do? They re they re don't like reading Revelation because they don't want to hear about these punishments, these judgments, these consequences. They don't want to read the Old Testament. Why? Because it's a prophecy from Re for Revelation. You know what? I'm going to black out everything that's bad here because I just want to read the good. Right? That's A lot of people do that. Right? <laughs> but the thing is, yeah, there's talk about judgment and consequences, the thing is, but the thing is, there's good in that as well. There's good in everything in here. But the thing is, how we perceive things, that's where the problem goes. When we lean on our own understanding, that's where the problems exist. That goes back to what we talked about during the opening. Well, I don't have, well, there's a reason why you don't have, there's a reason why, you, uh, there's, there's reasons. But the thing is, you're stopping there. Are you looking at the good? Don't stop at the negative. The negative could sure keep you down. And when you do that, when you're so focused on the negative, but 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 you're inviting the wrong person. You're not inviting the Lord. You're inviting the enemy, the serpent, to play with your thoughts, to play with your emotions, to put you down. Right? The serpent will try to bring you up just so he can turn around and put you down. But our Lord and Savior doesn't do that. There's no tricks. There's nothing up to sleeve. It's all in the word. It's in the truth. It's just that we choose what to read and what not to read. So in, in our essence, we're tricking ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And we're going to see a little bit about the, deceive, uh, the, the deceiving aspects here as we continue through the word. But people don't like reading because there's a lot of judgment. People don't like being judged. But guess what? If you read through Deuteronomy chapter 30, and just in reading 14 and 15, I see mercy. Look at the, it says, return, right? He's inviting him back. We have a graceful, merciful God. That's mercy. Mercy just right there. In verse 16 through 17, the return and the know the presence of the Lord. It says, and when you have multiplied and been fruitful in the land, in those days, declares the Lord, they shall say no more. The ark of the covenant of the Lord, it shall come to mind. Sorry, it shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. And all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. And they shall no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. Okay. Jeremiah Jeremiah looked forward to the restoration of Israel. He was looking forward. He looked forward to the day that when Israel would be a leading nation. He was looking forward. The Lord himself enthroned in Jerusalem. And the nations coming to what? Honor him. Honor him. In verse 18. We see um, in verse 18, we see the promise of the restoration. It goes on to say, in those days, the house of Judah shall join the house of Israel. And together they shall come from the land of the north to the land that I gave your fathers for a heritage. God prophesied that the millennial kingdom, he would join Israel and Judah. In other words, he would heal the civil war and the split that had taken place. He would heal. The Ark of the Covenant will no longer be necessary. But 
there's a problem with this restoration. In verse 19 through 20, it says, I said, how I would set you among your, my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Surely a treacherous wife leaves her husband. So you have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. There's the problem. Rhetorically, God asked how a backsliding Israel and Judah would be blessed. And he answered his own question. God pointed to the transformation. His people, despite their past, will be transformed. They will be transformed. But look at what he's saying here. He would set them among his sons and give you a pleasant land, the heritage most beautiful to all nations. I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Okay. What do they do? Did they learn their lesson? Nope. No. And we do the same. I, I talked about, Lord, thank you for, you know, giving me this job or, you know, whatever the case may be. I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to attend church, you know, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, twice. I'm going to, I'm going to read, I'm going to read through Je uh, Genesis three times in six months, you know. And then what happens in three weeks later, you know what, I know what I went to do groceries yesterday. But I have to go do groceries again. I'm too busy or and you know what? Next, you know what? Tomorrow, Lord, I promise. Tomorrow, tomorrow comes. Oh, no, tonight, 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 and then it never happens. Turn away. It's so easy to get distracted. It's so easy to just kind of go back to the way that you've been doing it for so long, the way that we want, not He wants. It's so easy to do that. In verse twenty-one through twenty-two, look at. Israel weeping. A voice on the bare heights is heard. The weeping and pleading of Israel's sons because they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, O faithless, faithless sons. I will hear your faithful, faithlessness. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Man, they are full of regrets. I'm sorry. We think about our, our our kids, right? Or you know, or when you were a kid, going to your parents. I'm so sorry. I think about this time where um, me and my brother were playing with my dad's guitar. He was at work playing with it. I broke I broke the strings. So I'm like, man, I'm I'm super smart. I'll put it back in the closet like nobody ever touched it. <laughs> and then my dad comes home. I don't know why. But he happened to go look at his guitar that day. Oh, no. I'm like, man, you couldn't let a couple of weeks go by to make it seem like it just happened. And he comes out and he's like, who broke my guitar? Oh, oh. Me and my brother's like, I don't know. <laughs> so he pulls out this little metal thing and he says, breathe in this. I'll tell if you're lying. Okay. So we breathe into it. I breathe into it. And then he goes, you did it. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I told my, my because I told on myself really because it went now when I reflect back that little metal thing that he told me to breathe into that was part of the old school blood pressure cuffs to gauge all taken apart. Uh -huh. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I told on myself I was weeping, but it was too late. And that's what's happening here. Israel's weeping, but now it's too late. It's too late. Jeremiah saw Israel in repentance, crying out to God spoke of the day when the children of Israel would respond to God's call. But their shame expressed in their repentance. In verse 23 through 25, truly the hills are a delusion, the orgies of the mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. But from our youth, the shameful things have devoured all for which our fathers labored 
their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. Let us lie down in our shame and let our dishonor cover us. For we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers, from our youth even to this day. And we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. The ending of chapter 3. You know, reading through this and just kind of reflecting back to that time, I see the cry of Nehemiah. I see the cry of Daniel, who interceded for a nation. They cried like they were personally at fault. They said to the Lord, we did this. We deserve judgment. I should have said that instead of playing it off. Well, you know what, Dad? I broke your guitar. How much easier my life would have been if I just did that. But we hide. I, I try to hide it just the same way as Adam tried to hide. The same way that Moses looked left and right and not looked up. So much easier would have it been if I just listened the first time or did it right the first time. Been in practice over and over again, I would know. But we call upon the Lord. We call upon your name to pour out your mercy. That's what we tell him. And this is good insight for us. We think about this because we see division we see evil we see hatred in our country we see a lot of bad things going on are we crying out to the lord lord look at what we have done right now all the stuff we see around us lord look at what we have done please forgive us Please forgive us. Now, as we enter the chapter four, we start off with the blessings to Israel. We, we see the, the crying out, but there's a blessing. There's a blessing. If you return, O Israel, to me you should return. If you remove your des detestable things from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness, then the nations shall be blessed, shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Okay. What I notice here, if you notice in the past several sections, how many times has the Lord said, Return, return, return? Many times. How many chances are we given and we keep blowing it? We keep blowing it. The, this God reminds them that it's not too late. Return to me, God says. It's almost like it's he's begging us. He's like, please. I, the way, at least the way I see it, it's like he's like, please, I don't want to see you in pain anymore. Please just listen to me. I don't want to see you go through this anymore. Please come to church. Please be in my word. Please be in fellowship. Please trust me. He's begging us. He's begging us. You'll know if you're living. You'll know if you're working. If you come to him. You'll know. In verses 3 through 4, it goes on, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among the thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. You know, the breaking up of fallow ground. God invited them to return 
from a very hardened condition. Okay, a very hardened condition. Think about, okay, follow ground. Follow ground is broken up by a plow. And in this sense, if we're looking at our hearts, the plow of conviction, the plow of conviction. It's about getting rid of the stuff that will choke out that seed. That will get rid, you know, when you plant the seeds of the Lord, they'll grow. But the things around us, the things that we want will choke it out and prevent it from growing, preventing you from doing the right thing, making the right choices, the right decisions. Think about an uncultivated and undeveloped land. It quickly becomes hardened. You have to plow the ground to give the seed a chance to get into the soil and grow. And that happens to us. Our hearts become hardened. So when your heart becomes hardened because, you know, Lord, I don't have this. I don't want, you know, all this other stuff. You, you go through your list of excuses. When you go and try to read the word, your heart is still hard. You're not allowing it to be cultivated. You're not allowing it to be planted to grow properly. God challenges the people of Judah, just like challenging us. Break the hardness of your hearts so my word can register. Think about this. Do you remember a time when your heart was hard? In the past, before he became a believer? And sometimes it becomes hard even as a believer. Something didn't go your way. You didn't get what you want. We shake our fist. How did it feel? Did you feel right with God? So why do you think that people don't want to hear you talk about the Lord? When you go out in the community or you're sharing at work or, or, or anything of that. Why do you think that they act the way they do? Because us as humans, we are thick-headed. We have a hardened heart. It happens. But when we repent, there's a softening that takes place. The cultivation starts. The, the plow of conviction works through and starts prepping your heart to take in the word, to soak it in. Watch it grow within you and then watch the fruit that it provides in your life. You remember when John the Baptist came to prepare people's hearts. Think back, think back to when John the Baptist was going through. What was the baptism about? It was the baptism of repentance. In Luke chapter 7 verses 29 through 30, it says, when all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just having been baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Those who repented in preparation for the Messiah by receiving baptism found it easy to receive what Jesus said. Their heart was already being cultivated. They were able to take it in. They were able to soak it in. The others that they talked about in there, their pride was too much. Their wants, their excuses, all these other things got in their way and started choking the seed. Now we see Jeremiah switching the image, switching the picture. He moves away from the unplowed field and now moves to the idea of circumcision. Circumcision is a picture of cutting away the flesh. It is called now, actually circumcision was talked about a lot in the Old Testament, but if you look in the New Testament, it's called what? Dying to self. Dying to self. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 through 30. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right eye, right hand causes the whole body, oh sorry, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body to go to hell. Okay. Jesus stressed that one must be willing to sacrifice to be obedient. And what I thought about when reading that is this. Sacrifice. Are you willing to die to self? Are you willing to stop those excuses? Stop looking at your wants and look at what you need from God. Because our Lord and Savior knows what we need. He knows what we want. But if we're not obedient, how can we expect that B and C to follow A? That's a process. God drew his people with kind words, but also told them of the consequences. The consequences of the continued rejection. If they did not return, judgment was waiting. And you know, sometimes we are prone to forgetting. I can tell you right now, I'm a very forgetful person. Sometimes we're told to do something and we forget or we take too long. Oh, 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 I forgot. Well, you were told to do that like four weeks ago, right? We, sometimes we think that we, what we heard is baloney or hot air. Oh, that's not, you know, nah, right? Or it's not true. We tend to mistake God for acting like men sometimes. Men can forget when they make a threat. God never forgets. And his delays of judgment is only because of his mercy. He never forgot. It goes back to what we just talked about in, in a minute ago. He gives us plenty of chances. He didn't forget. But we are so thankful that he's merciful. So thankful that he's merciful. In verses 5 through 18, the coming judgment. You know, it's getting harder. It's getting harder. Decla declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet through the land. Cry out loud and say, assemble and let us go into the fortified cities. Raise a standard toward Zion. Flee for uh, safety. Stay not. For I bring disaster from the north and great destruction. A lion has gone up from his thicket. A destroyer of nations has set out. He has gone out from his place to make your land a waste. Your cities will be ruins without inhabitants. For this put on sack, for this put on sackcloth, lament and wail. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. The coming judgment. Notice how the Lord is telling the Jews ahead of time to leave. Because those who would listen would be able to avoid the attack. That's another warning. He's like, hey, you guys. God knew the majority of the people would not listen, though. And the same goes for us. He knows who's going to listen and who's not. So Jeremiah saw this army come from the north to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. They prepared this defense, but it was no, no help. No help. Jeremiah pictured God's people finally repenting, but it was too late. It was too late. They couldn't prevent this terrible judgment. The Babylonians conquered Judah. Verses 9 through 10. Now we have the effect and the nature of the judgment. And it goes on to say, In that day, declares the Lord, courage shall fail both king and officials. The priests shall be applauded and the prophets astounded. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, surely you have utterly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, It shall be well with you. 
whereas the sword has reached their very life. Something I want you to really notice with what we're ending with tonight. This is really important. Okay. Really important. When Jeremiah heard that the Babylonians would wreak havoc upon the land, he said this, Lord, you deceived the people. Why have you allowed the prophets to cry peace? Well, if we look at Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, he answers. He says, The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule at their discretion. My people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? False prophets, corrupt leaders, loved by the people, but they have no foundation. You know, and I think about that. What did we just talk about a second ago where he said, you know what? He's, it's like he's done dealing with the nations. He's going to you individually. And that's what he's saying here. He says, my people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? What will you do? You have a choice. You have a decision. Don't worry about what's going on outside these doors anymore. What are you going to do? When Jeremiah heard this, I can only imagine what went through his head. And I think about this because people always want to hear pleasant things. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about what they can't get. They do not want to hear about what they can't have. They just want to hear this pleasant message that would not challenge them. They don't like people don't like to be challenged. They want the easy. People wanted to hear this message that would not convict them. When judgment comes, Judah will lose courage. They will lose hope. When judgment comes, the spiritual leaders will not know what to do. That's what's happening here. Why? Because they did not return to the Lord. How many times does he have to tell them? How many times does he have to tell us? And I think about this. We do have a merciful God. Yes, he reminds us all the time. But there's going to be a time that it's going to be too late. Oh, it's okay. You know what? I'll fix it at the end of the week. Well, you better hope it doesn't come tonight. Because at the end of the week, it's going to be too late. They didn't return to the Lord. They didn't break the follow ground. They didn't circumcise their hearts. It was not the Lord God who deceived the people. Think about that. It was so easy for them to blame God and not themselves. And we do the same thing. It was Johnny's fault that I didn't get that job. It is Susie's fault that I don't have friends. It is Jane's fault that I didn't pass that test. We're so quick to be like, boop, 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 right? But we're very slow to say, Lord, it's me. I'm sorry. And here, the, it wasn't the Lord who deceived the people. It was the false prophets. So what does he do? Forget about these over here saying this and this. What do you want to do? What are you going to do when the end comes? What are you going to do now? That's what he's doing now. And that's what we're going to end with tonight. For you to reflect on what are you going to do? And next week, we will continue on to get into the anguish over Judah's desolation. Let us close in prayer. Father God. Again, Lord, we are thankful of the, how merciful you are to us, Lord. But Lord, give us strength and not take advantage of that, Lord. Lord, help us be closer to you. Give us strength 
to do more for you, be more like you, Lord, to repent, to be able to come to you and say, Lord, it is us. It is me. Help me. Lord, we love you. And yes, we are sorry that we keep falling, but we're so thankful that you keep lifting. So Lord, wherever we're at tonight, Lord, wherever our heart and mind is, Lord, soften it up. Let it be cultivated. Let it be plowed, Lord, and let it be ready to soak in the seeds of your love, the seeds of you, so that way we can grow. We can become more like you and share with others. And Lord, even if it's just sharing with one, Lord, we know that the angels will be dancing and joyful in heaven. But it starts with us being more focused on you. Be with us as we wind down, Lord. Let us reflect on you. Be with our family. Be prepared for the day that come, the week, the month, the year. Let us stop making excuses and say, Lord, use me. Help us be in a position to be used by you. Lord, we lift this all to you. In your name we pray. Amen. And God bless.